Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCGO codes, including the stuff from Shining Fates, make sure you go ahead and check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. Welcome to part three of the Battle Style set review. Once again, joined by Jack to go over, this time the one prize Pokemon of Battle Styles that are worth talking about. You can go back and check out the trainers as well as the VMAX sections of our set review, but this is the final one. So let's re-familiarize ourselves with the ratings based on one to five on how good we think the cards are going to be in the new standard format. You can also listen in on the community's thoughts on these cards. So it's not just our word you can take for it. We had over a hundred responses. So thank you so much for everyone who did. I really do think it adds something here. So anyone who disagrees with us can side with the community instead. First off, we have Cherim, and we're starting with some sad violins because this card we think had so much potential, but it just falls short of the mark. Uh, Cherim is an ATHP stage one with the Spring Bloom ability. As often as you like during your turn, you may attach a grass energy from your hand to one of your Pokemon, except Pokemon with a rule box. So this is Deluge on a stage one for grass energy for one prizes. When you say it like that, that seems insane. That's a one prize Deluge. Deluge has been insane on two prizes. Uh, on stage two, sorry, and this is on a stage one. So that's already in a lot of people's books great. Unfortunately, you then remember we have something like a Frostmoth in format, uh, and that hasn't seen too much play in general. Now, there are obviously different stipulations to Frostmoth, and they don't sort of hold hands in terms of they'll live together and die together. Uh, but also, Frostmoth does have, we feel, a wider array of attackers because it can attach to rule box Pokemon, uh, albeit only water Pokemon, whereas Cherim can attach to any um, type of Pokemon. We still think Frostmoth probably has better attackers, which is kind of unfortunate, uh, given that this is more universal um, energy acceleration. There is a Tapu Bulu in the set that has Nature's Judgment that um, kind of has similar vibes to... Bulu's of the past that does a lot of damage for a one prizer, and that was sort of the out of the box natural combo, and I think will be a decent one prize archetype. Um, with the OPOP League having a couple of single prize weeks in the past, we can kind we kind of look at these cards a little bit differently sometimes, um, and there's definitely merit to that archetype in kind of a more limited format. But 160 uh, just isn't really cutting the mustard in terms of uh, the way old sort of Vika Bulu did. Uh, which is unfortunate. There's a couple of other niche uh, attackers. We've seen Katana paired with a couple of, uh, well, played in a couple of ways in the past, uh, as well as some highlight reel moments from Maractus. And these two archetypes probably get a little bit more consistent with having energy acceleration, uh, but none of them are really going to break the bank. None of them are really going to make massive waves. Uh, but Cherim is definitely one to keep an eye on. As soon as this gets a relatively stable attacker, I think this could be a very strong archetype. Uh, it's just waiting for that really strong one prize attacker that's going to break the mold. Um, so maybe keep them in mind, but unfortunately we have found it to be pretty underwhelming overall compared to uh, even things like Frost Moth, which are still, you know, tier three at best. Yeah, Moth has better targets and has Bucket. And if anyone's played Moth, they know how hard it is just to chain three energy per turn. And when <laughs> these guys have such low hit points, you're going to have to do that without the help of the Bucket. Next up, we move on to Durant. Durant is a scary spiritual reprint of the previous Durant from uh, Noble Victories way back when. This is a 90 hit point grass type basic that has vice grip for one for 20, but devour is the thing that most people are talking about for this card. For each of your Durant in play, discard the top card of your opponent's deck. Obviously, you'll be attacking with one. The idea is to have three on the board. So with level balls and quick balls, you can quite easily achieve that. You do need to have twin energy or have some acceleration on your side, be it the new Cherim or possibly just basic energies and the uh, string of EXP shares around your board to chain attacks. But the problem really here is that even if you are devouring each turn and even if you are able to chain four into play, which will be difficult, even with eight ball search cards and needing to ornery rod every single turn because a Durant will be getting knocked out every turn, no doubt about it because it's just so fragile. Um, it's just not enough card discard, to be honest. Obviously, there's ADP in the format, so that's going to make your turn clock much shorter than average games. There's also going to be uh, Rapid Strike Urshifu, which is, again, shortening that turn clock, uh, even if you are playing Mew and Ordinary Rod and that sort of thing. 
um, they will have turns where they'll be taking multiple prizes. So yeah, just a ton of reasons to be scared to play Durant right now. I still feel the best way to play control is just going to be having Munchlax dolls and spamming crushing hammers and billowing fans just to prevent attacks throughout the entire game uh, than having Durant here. Back in the day, Durant could attack for just one uh, metal energy, which was way easier, meant that you could keep your chain going with less commitment in your deck. So you could actually have spaces for disruption cards. Here, you're going to be having to use traditional supporters just to draw into your next twin energy, just to draw into your next ordinary rod, and the Durant that you've just put back into your deck after being KO'd. So there'll be a ton of turns where you're not getting the full four discard value, and that kind of needs to be happening if you ever want to see this to have success. Next up, we have Tapu Bulu, which is one that I mentioned just a minute ago when talking about Cherim. Uh, it has 130 HP, and the first attack is push down for 20, which switches your opponent's active one of their bench. Uh, never really going to see too much utility there. Nature's Judgment is the attack we're really looking at, which does 80 plus 80 more if you discard all of the energy attached to Bulu. Obviously, you can see the synergy there. You attach three energy, then discard them all and do 160. Uh, but we've just said how, um, you know, energy can be, finding energy can be a little bit difficult, so Cherim isn't even necessarily the correct partner. Uh, maybe this is a better partner would be something like a Rillaboom. And at that point, you're playing uh, sort of Raweg Rillaboom with Bulu's as attackers. Well, you're already playing the Raweg that can do 150, which is 10 damage less, and you don't have to discard the energy every turn. Uh, so you can immediately see it's not the best sort of attacker. One merit to Bulu uh, is at least it's only three energy rather than four. So if you do need a one energy or a one prize attacker to break through certain types of walls that GXs can't break through. Um, Boodoo can do it in one turn, whereas Rillaboom probably can't, but even so, like that's a super niche scenario. So this could be a nice just one energy or, or one prize uh, way of dealing a big chunk of damage in a turn, but there's no reason to believe this is going to be anything more than a minor tech card in certain situations. Next up, we're combining Weeping Bell and Salazzle. We believe that these two are sort of printed to be played together. We don't think that the dangerous slime of Weeping Bell is going to be a strong enough effect just on its own. We believe these will only be played within one archetype. Let me explain. First of all, the Weeping Bell is a grass type stage one with 80 hit points. Always good to note when things have 90 or less, which both of these stage ones do, so you will certainly be playing level ball in the deck. This is also has Turfield Synergy, which is nice. That ability is called Dangerous Slime. When you play this Pokemon from your hand to evolve, you may leave your opponent's active burned and poisoned. So that's immediately 30 damage effectively um, from these status conditions. Uh, but I believe that <coughs> probably Leon is just an easier way to be a damage mod right now. Potentially even just Zigzagoon scoop up net takes up less spaces and is less work than the Weeping Bell. So like I said, not good enough to see play outside of this deck, but it's far more than 30 damage when paired with Salazzle, who is trying to use that burning mockery attack which is 90 for each spe uh, special condition affecting your opponent's active Pokemon. So straight out the gates, the Dangerous Slime doing 30 damage and the two statuses means that you're hitting 210, which is obviously very good. And of course, we do have the Cheer Yell Horn in the format as well, which can push the Salazzle into ridiculous territory um, to do potentially one shots on tag teams and that sort of thing. So a certainly dangerous attacker. It's a fire type as well, which bodes well for the amount of Zacian and possibly uh, even things like the Luke Metal um, and the new Corviknight builds that could be in the format. That's going to be nice for you. You have Twin Energy and Triple Acceleration available, so you're just going to be one energy attaching throughout the entire game. And yeah, trying to use Scoop Up Net to pick up and put down your Weeping Bell all the time and spam this Burning Mockery attack. The reason why we're leaving this at just a two-star is that in many situations, your opening turns has to put down two Salandits and two Bell uh, Bell Sprouts just to be in the game in the first place. Because if you only put down one of either of the two things, your opponent can gust KO one of those pieces, and then you either can't evolve into a Weeping Bell or you can't evolve into a Salazzle to attack in the first place. So you can be denied very, very easily. So your setup is difficult, and you need to continuously have the setup going. You need to always have your next scoop up net. You always need to have your next weeping bell available. 
you need to chain your salazzles. That means you're going to have to find rod on certain turns. You're going to have to find twins on every single turn of the game. You don't really have the board space to put down Oricorios, Jirachis, uh, Dedenes, that sort of thing. Um, you're going to need to put Mew into play against exactly um, the Urshifu deck. So straight away, that's going to be awkward for you. Another bench space being eaten up straight away means that you can't have any support whatsoever. So extensive setup, not much room su for support Pokemon at all. And there's going to be just tons of vulnerability where you miss your next Salandit, you miss your next Scoop Up Net, and there'll be a break of the chain in all of these attacks. Next up, we have Embor. This is the first single strike one prize that we've seen. Embor has the is a stage two, obviously, and has the ability Fighting Fury Stance, which says your single strike Pokemon's attacks do 30 more damage. We've seen abilities like this in the past. There was an Incineroar that did this, but it could, you can only use one ability per turn. This is actually stackable, which when you compare uh, is pretty insane. But obviously the difficulty is this is a stage two. Uh, we can muster this into play, and obviously you've got things like Tower of Darkness and stuff to help uh, make some of these other cards, um, you know, at least draw pieces. It's worth noting that the Tepig and the Pig Knight are also single strike cards, so you can use them as uh, draw twos. Uh, and I think that's kind of the way we're going to have to see uh, support basics in future, just for them to have any utility. But this is still a stage two, so realistically you're probably going to be looking at mustard in this out if you want to have it consistently. And we already said when we were discussing Mustard that it just doesn't. we just don't have the tools to be able to build decks around Mustard right now. Uh, if you're going first, you're pretty sad because you can't play the card your deck is built around. Uh, so you have to immediately supplement Mustard as like a an additional support role. And then you're playing uh, a, a, these Embors that sometimes get into play because you manage to sometimes Mustard. And all of a sudden, it seems very, very convoluted to be able to you know, just get this plus 30 damage when we already have uh, attacks that can almost one-shot anything in the format anyway. Obviously, with this Fighting Fury stance, it would push us over the line of one-shotting everything in format, but with enough single strike energy, um, you're able to do that anyway. So yes, you require more pieces uh, in terms of, well, in, arguably you don't even require more pieces to be able to get over the line with um, single strike energy as opposed to Embor. So a very flashy card. But unfortunately, I feel like until we have some way of making these mustard decks more consistent, uh, we're not going to be able to have the luxury of playing uh, some of these strong stage two Pokemon with single strike a bit with this with single strike abilities. Next up, we have another package of cards. This time, it's going to be the Galarian Mr. Rhyme as well as Yampa. Again, we think neither of these can exist uh, on their own. We think they are paired together all in this set. Galarian Mr. Rhyme being the attacking threat here for. Um, two colorless energy ball juggling does 10 plus 40 more for each item with ball that you discard from your hand so think of it like a um, baby blown but instead of doing a 50 times multiplier you get 10 base and then you're doing a 40 times multiplier for each ball card now there's up and downsides to this obviously the upside is that ball cards are more usable in the opening stages just so you don't get donked obviously the Blounds can certainly suffer from having bad hands in those opening turns because you just have a ton of fire energies and nothing to do with them. Um, but on the flip side, you don't have as good recovery as you do for energies as you do for ball cards. Uh, obviously, there's Crystal and there's Energy Retrieval. Um, but here, we're trying to use Yampa instead to get back our ball cards because, of course, it's not going to be enough for you to pad your deck out with about 20 balls, which I think is possible. You can play Quick Ball, Level Ball, Poker Ball, Great Ball, Cherish Ball, and that's going to be your complement of ball cards um, to try and do big damage. Um, but Yampa can ball fetch when you put this into play. Um, a Pokeball and a Great Ball from your discard pile. So you will certainly be playing four Pokeball, for Great Ball, so that you can yamp them back all the time, trying to use, you know, multiple copies of Yamper as well as Scoop Up Net to fulfill that to fill up your hand with the Galarian Mr. Rhyme. Ball Guy as well from Shining Fates certainly will be chipping in here. He can act as um, early game consistency to get multiple Mr. Mimes into play and get you access to Yampers or even things like Zacian and Oricorio. Both of these has obviously seen play in um, Blounds, just because you're trying to build that hand up to take big one-hit KOs. And uh, Bull Guy can also act as, obviously, 120 damage for you, which is a really big deal and one of your biggest combo pieces. I've put a quick uh, graphic of the damage you need to be scaling up towards. So, really, uh, you need to be getting around, you know, six, seven, eight uh, 
uh, balls all being discarded in one go. That's a tough ask with the amount of stamp and the amount of money in the mo in the format right now, as well as the fact that you need to be not using these ball search cards to find your next Mr. Rhyme, to find your next Mr. Mime, and to find your next like twin energy and your next triple acceleration. So that's always the awkward thing here. It's that sometimes you need to reduce your damage output just to stay in the game, just to get your next Pokemon online. So that can be really awkward. You need to find alternate ways to get your Pokemon into play, or you need to really manage your resources very, very carefully. Can you even afford to play a Pokeball in this spot? Can you afford to use a level ball? Sometimes you have to accept that you'll take a turn off attacking altogether, knowing that you could maybe like ball fetch the following turn and establish two Mr. Mimes, knowing that you can take a comeback in the following turn. So yeah, some missteps are certainly available here and ultimately this is just more convoluted than Blounds. Uh, having water typing is pretty okay if Victini is going to kick on as well as I think it will, uh, but that's really the only, only upside I can see for this archetype over just playing good old Blounds. Next up we have Kingdra, a fan favorite, but unfortunately one that we don't think is going to quite uh, make its mark. It has the call to the call of the Abyss ability, sorry, when the uh, when your active Pokemon is knocked out by damage, you may choose any number of water energy attached to that Pokemon and move them to this Pokemon. So essentially, uh, the two ways we've thought of building this are Articuno-based and Frostmoth-based with Waylord um, using Draw Up, as well as just being able to run a thin uh, complement of Frostmoth potentially as well, to lean into the Kingdra's Aqua Burst attack, which is 40 times the number of water energy attached to this Pokemon. Obviously, you can see the synergy there. You can go from Kingdra to Kingdra to Kingdra, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, your early game can be sort of Waylord, draw up a load of energy onto the active. If you lose the energy, or if you get knocked out, you move to the Kingdra. If not, you can just use Ocean Waves. Um, but at that point, it feels like if you're potentially wanting to use Ocean Waves anyway, why not just play Frostmoth Waylord anyway? Because there's no, there, we don't really feel there's any necessity to be playing a stage two line in that deck just to cover the fact that sometimes you'll get knocked out um a lot of the time you're going to get knocked out right now because waylord is water weak anyway uh, is lightning weak anyway so in general this is like a stage two version of a deck that is already in a pretty bad spot um with nice high roll meme potential but typically the stage two um sort of line of text is going to be holding it back because you're going to have to you know, find a nice combination, a nice management of your resources between candies, Pokemon, buckets, um, you know, getting these things like Waylord into the active and using draw up, discarding uh, a load of energy in the first place to try and get maximum value out of draw up. Uh, you know, it's all just a little bit too much for just not quite enough payoff. Uh, yeah, again, there will be highlight reel moments, of course. Uh, it's a stage two with a pretty strong attack and a pretty strong ability, but just the fact that it's a stage two right now mean, makes it almost unplayable, unfortunately. Yep, break the chain, lose the game was my motto when testing this deck. <laughs> <laughs> Next up we have Octillery. This card is incredible. If you've seen any of the previous reviews talking about the trainers, talking about the Urshifu, you know that we are big fans of Octillery. We think that it could see play in a number of the Urshifu builds. However, it is possible to build Urshifu without Octillery. That's why we're only giving it the four-star treatment. There will certainly be builds of Urshifu that don't play the Sushi Master. But for those that do, you do get some big payoffs here. The ability is Rapid Strike Search. Once during a turn, you may search your deck for a Rapid Strike card, reveal it and put it into your hand, then shuffle your deck. You can't use more than one Rapid Strike Search ability each turn. That is super relevant text. It means that you're probably only going to be playing a 1-1 one, one, or 2-2 two, two line maximum in Octillery, expecting to only ever get one into play in every game that you use, because there's no point in having two on board outside of like playing around boss knockout kind of things, which isn't super relevant in a lot of situations because it is just a one prizer anyways. Um, but yeah, this card is super versatile. If you have communication, you can go ahead and grab Octillery, and then it instantly pays for itself by getting you like an Urshifu V Max or an Urshifu V. You can go ahead and grab a Rapid Strike Energy, which we all know is pretty much the glue of Urshifu. You really need this to be able to spam your G Max Rapid Flows and get some of your other attackers rolling, things like Empoleon. It can also be an access to retreating for your Rapid Strikers. Every one of your Rapid Strike Pokemon has two or less retreat, which is amazing. If you want to play tech cards like Billowing Fan for the right moment, you can search it out. And one of the big bugbears of having cards like these in low counts in your deck is that you just can't time it properly. But Octillery being a tutor for this means that you can Billowing Fan at the perfect moment. 
um, to be disruptive for the opponents. Also, Karina's motivation means you can be a stamp proofing mechanism. So tons of reasons to love Octillery. The only reason it's not been given the five star is that we know how good Dedenne is, we know how good Crobat is, <laughs> we know how good Eldegoss is, and Celebi can be a pseudo means of getting Rapid Strike into play. So it depends on what Urshi build you're using and how much space you have in your deck to actually justify an auxiliary line, but it will really definitely be the ones that are heavy on Urshifu and heavy on Empoleon that will certainly take advantage of it, and I do think that will be one of the best ways to play auxiliary. So amazing card, love to see tutoring in the game. It's just such a good skill, uh, skill testing card as well um, to take advantage of cherry picking. So yeah, amazing to see, gonna be really powerful. And um, yeah, love him. Next up, we have Boltund. Boltund is a 130 HP stage one. And the attack we're really looking at here, it's got a corner attack, which we've seen in the past has been pretty um, useful in niche situations. But we're really looking at Defiant Spark here. Uh, for 130, if, the po if this Pokemon has any damage counters on it, the cost of the attack is just one lightning. So basically, we're just thinking about ways of uh, getting some energy, getting some damage counters onto the Bolton to be able to just do 130 for one, which honestly is pretty efficient. Unfortunately, it's a stage one though, so that's a little bit awkward. Um, the ways we have to damage the Boltund itself aren't great. We have like Jinx Spiritomb combo. Uh, maybe you can even lead into um, you know a couple of like other niche combos, but typically Jinx is going to be the only way you can access damage counters onto this guy, particularly efficiently. And even then, you're going to have to probably chain stage ones fairly consistently because um you 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 only have 120 hp essentially so you're going to be getting knocked out every turn uh so unfortunately it just doesn't seem very sustainable we have things like donfan and whimsicott in format which are also stage ones which both have upside in our opinion donfan does the whole one for 120 a lot more efficiently and because you don't need this uh sort of cost and Whimsicott can actually do a little bit more than 150 and has obvious level ball synergy as well as great typing. Those two both have great typing, to be honest. So unfortunately, Bolton isn't going to be quite good enough, but um, an interesting one, again, for these kind of one prize formats that we see popping up every now and again, uh, because in those kind of formats, it could potentially see uh, some experimentation. But in standard, it's not going to quite make it, we don't think. It's such a shame because the Yamp is so cool. I would love to be like a one prize deck that could get a free Great Ball every time you put down your main attacker. <laughs> like that's super cool. Yeah. But the Boltund is just, yeah, far off the mark for the options that we already have. Next up, we have Meowstic. It's another stage one with an ability that we thought was worth mentioning, but probably won't be seeing the heights. The community are in a similar frame of mind here. It's actually got a similar effect to Bennett GX, which did see play. And there have been previous iterations of, you know, even Bennett itself, which has had this effect before. And it has been usable, but these days one counter means a lot less than it used to. And this is committing multiple spaces, which is a problem. The ability is ear movement. Once during a turn, you may move one counter from one of your Pokemon to one of your opponents. Also, that stipulation of it having to be on your side means that, you know, you're not always going to have damage in play. If your opponent's just knocked something out or if they're playing a one hit KO deck, there'll be a ton of situations where you may not have that damage. Um, or you may be forced to play extra combo cards, again, like Spiritomb, that sort of thing, just to be putting counters on your other opponent's stuff. The problem is, straight away, if you play a 1-1 line, like, that could immediately be, like, two Zigzagoons in your deck instead. If you need that damage output, you could be playing two Vit Bands, that sort of thing, which is going to probably be more consistent and not take up a bench space. And if you want to have more damage counters, you can just put in more Scoop Up Nets for those Zigzagoons. So, probably just getting beaten out by a good old Headbutt Tantrum, unfortunately, um, but a fun ability nonetheless. Next up we have Orbeetle, and this is definitely another fun one. Orbeetle has the attack Evo Control. For each energy attached to this Pokemon, you may search your deck for a stage 2, excluding Orbeetle, and put it onto your bench. Not sure why they excluded Orbeetle, but I'm sure there's a reason. Um, so obviously this feels uh, quite similar to Meganium of the past, but no, I don't think it's going to be as consistent because this is an attack rather than ability. So Oz Meganium could only get one out per turn, and this could get three, four, maybe even five, if you can double Welder plus three CE. Unfortunately, um, if you can only get one or two, you're going to have to attack with an Orbeetle again. You've already been told you can't get another Orbeetle out with this, so you're going to have to set up another Orbeetle just to get more Stage 2s out. So obviously, inherently worse than Meganium, even though it has very similar vibes. Some of the best ones we could think of were things like Charizard um, with the Battle Sensibility, Decidueye for some stalling. Cinderace actually has seen 
um, a lot of success in Sword and Shield on meta and has started to creep into the standard meta just a little bit. Nowhere near as successful, but it is actually at least seeing a little bit of play. So that's probably the best stage two you can get cheat into play right now because it's so energy efficient. You're, it really requires no extra setup after you've um, done the whole Orbital thing, as well as Incineroar just buffing that damage. But, you know, it's 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 all very flashy and it's all very magical, but unfortunately, um, we don't think it's really worth it. There's like the stage twos we have, uh, arguably are pretty good and still don't see play when we have decks like dedicated to building around them. And in this deck, you're dedicated to building around something that then gets into them. Why would you not just sort of play the 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 basics and the candies into the Charizard rather than the Orbital itself? So high roll potential once again, but really not going to be. Uh, making strides just because it's too much work for archetypes that we've had for a little while and haven't seen play anyway. Next up we have Mien Xiao. It's a rapid strike fighting type with 90 hit points, which is always cool because you can open up level ball for yourself. And you have two attacks. The first is pound, one for 20, but spinning whip is probably the more interesting one here. For a fighting colorless or just one rapid strike energy, you do 90, your opponent's active is now confused, and you shuffle this Pokemon and all cards attached back into your deck. So it's kind of like a Greedent, kind of like a Behem. It sits between those um, because you're obviously putting it back into the deck, whereas Greedent's straight to hand. Uh, but you get the upside of like minus 10 damage, but you get to confuse the opponent. And the real hope here is that it's annoying for your opponent to find boss and switch out in the same hand all the time. Not very easy to do. Rope is that pseudo thing, which is a bit annoying. <laughs> so you probably need to put double Don into play as well as double Mien Fu. And you're going to have to continually loop that. The upsides of this is that you can potentially have one artillery in play, which can help you get your next Rapid Strike Energy or your next Mien Shao. So you only need one of those two pieces to be in your hand each turn. And hopefully, you know, with Brunos and other supporters like that, possibly you could uh, refresh your hand and make sure that that's going to be available for you. So yeah, really, this is just trying to say that confusion is annoying. And <laughs> that's not always the case with the amount of Switch cards that we have in the game right now. Um, so yeah, I feel like... It's not going to be worth shuffling back into your deck. There's tons of ways you can get punished if you don't find double Mien Fu as well as Mien Chao and Energy. Even with one Rapid Strike Search each turn, it's not going to be that easy to piece together. Uh, and the damage output is still extremely poor. So overall, there's better Rapid Strikers you could be using, that's for certain. Next up, we have Primate. This is another single strike Pokemon. With the Basically, we're looking at the Frenzy Bomb attack here for two Fighting Energy. You 50 times the number of Pokemon uh, on your bench with any damage counters on them. So obviously immediate synergy with Single Strike or Hound Doom because you're able to attach to your benched Pokemon from your deck and then put two damage counters on them. You can then manipulate that damage onto two targets with uh, with Jinx, sorry, as well as having Spiritomb to perhaps just give you a little bit of supplementary uh, damage counter addition to be doing big damage with Frenzy Bomb. And honestly, this deck feels not too far off the mark in terms of actually being able to compete with some of these big archetypes. You can trade into v uh, to Vs fairly consistently because three damage Pokemon plus two strength single strike energy is uh, 190, and then just an extra da uh, damage Pokemon is 240, which is knocking out pretty much all of the relevant uh, two, uh, two prizes. You struggle a little bit more with three prizes, but you can trade twice into them, so at least you can kind of uptrade there. Obviously, that's where things start to get awkward, though, because you need to be attaching twice and finding Mankeys and Primates every turn, that kind of thing. That's where Bruno can help. Bruno, obviously, we mentioned in the past, letting you shuffle and draw four, and if something was knocked out, you'd shuffle draw seven instead. So it all kind of synergizes around this kind of single strike archetype uh, with Tower of Darkness then being the backbone just to get a little bit of extra supplementary draw. It seems to all be kind of perfect. But unfortunately, we found it to be just a little bit too inconsistent to really break ranks in the top tiers. Um, I think there's definitely something there. And I think with a little bit more support, this could be actually a fairly threatening one prize archetype. But from our experience, having to get multiple stage two, stage ones into play that need more than one attachment, even though you have acceleration, uh, you kind of need double hound, do, double hound hour, double manky on turn one, and then basically a manky every turn as well as sort of things like the energy, uh, like Vitality GR consistently. Uh, and even in certain situations, you'll miss an energy drop, you'll miss a Vitality Jar, 
you'll whiff off of Bruno, stuff like that. And even with all of the draw from Tower of Darkness and stuff, it's just not enough to keep this deck consistent enough to, like I say, really break ranks in those top tier, uh, top tiers of the format. But I think this this deck feels pretty close in terms of a single strike, single prize archetype uh, that can potentially do some damage in the future. It's just not quite there yet, we don't think. Next up, we have Sandaconda for those trying to meme out there. The Sand Cannon is perfect for you. You do 60 times the amount of fighting energy you discarded from the top six cards of your deck. So this is an upgrade to the Gyarados that we had from Team Up, I believe it was. And uh, yeah, a 60 times multiplier certainly is scary. Fighting typing isn't the worst. You're a one energy attacker. You need to warp your deck massively by going up to like 25 plus energy, probably more towards that 30 mark realistically. So your deck is going to be pretty trash. You're going to be drawing brick hands the entire time with the hope that that sand cannon is getting absurd. Um, so yeah, you really need to play a very specific engine. Even if you are um, discarding those energies, it's not like they get shuffled back in. So you're going to have to find ways to recover those energies, be it with rods or with Brock's grit, something like that. Finding the chain of Sandaconda is going to be next to impossible with your draw engine. Let's be realistic. You're going to probably just play greens and maybe like Sinlins to recover greens. That's really the only thing I can think of. Um, so yeah, good luck having fun with Sandaconda. I'm ready for those highlight reels. Next up, we have Golbat and Crobat, two cards that I think a lot of uh, a lot of people, myself included, uh, had high hopes for. But we think the more the more we think about it, they're not going to quite uh, shake up anything too much. Golbat has Stealthy Draw. When you evolve a Zubat, you draw two from a Zubat, you draw two cards. And Crobat has Sneaky Draw. When you evolve from a Golbat, you draw three cards. So obviously, very nice um, sort of draw out there. Maybe an Eternatus style deck, you can run. Uh, some sort of Golbat, Crobat shenanigans to lose a little bit less to stamp, but we already have uh, Crobat V, and if you're being stamped low, maybe the Ball Search card would be just be better looking for a Crobat V that you saved rather than just dumping a Crobat down. I see, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people just play Crobats for the sake of Crobats, but saving one or two Crobats in Eternatus uh, when, when playing Eternatus just to not lose to stamp uh, is probably going to be better than trying to jam in a Stage 2 line. We also have uh, a Manetric that draws, th well, is essentially better than the Golbat, but then doesn't have the Crobat option, but it draws three cards. When you evolve from an Electric, it's seen no play. And we also have Inteleon, which tutors out two trainer cards, which essentially tutor out anything because the two trainer cards can be supporters, they can be more Pokemon, they can be ways to find energy, and that's not seeing any play either. So typically, raw draw is worse than... Um, Tutoring, and I think even tutoring trainers is probably slightly preferable to raw draw when you're only drawing two or three cards. So unfortunately, whilst drawing cards, we're always happy to see drawing cards uh, in the game. I'm pretty sure Golbat and Crobat don't quite uh, really fit the bill in terms of being good stamp proving outs because they just make the deck clunkier in the first place. Next up, we have Houndoom. We've mentioned it a bunch when talking about Primeape just a moment ago. So let's fully familiarize ourselves. Single Strike Raw, once during a turn you may search your deck for a Single Strike Energy, attach it to one of your Single Strike Pokemon, then shuffle your deck. If you attach an energy to a Pokemon in this way, put two counters onto that Pokemon. So technically that's upside for making Primate's Frenzy Bomb do more damage. Although you're putting it onto your Primate most of the time, you can use Jinx to throw them back to the bench, which is helpful. It is disadvantageous, obviously, for things like Single Strike Urshifu, because you can put yourself... If you overuse Single Strike Raw with, you know, the multiple that you can have in play... You can push yourself down into ranges of damage, like 290 hit points for like a Swordization, something like that. Could start to get quite scary, and like Eternatus can maybe start getting into range. Not that you should really worry about that matchup, but even things like Center Scorch and that other stuff and mirror matches, you've got to be a little bit careful there. Uh, the small upside, though, is that you're making the scroll, the Raging Scroll, a little bit stronger for yourself. So uh, a little bit of cuteness there to be uh, playing around with damage counters, but overall... Deck acceleration on a stage one is crazy good, especially when the energy is crazy, crazy good. Uh, you're getting two damage counters to also do two more damage to the opponent effectively each time. You have Vitality Jar that puts it in the perfect place for you. You want those single strike energy in the deck so that Houndoom can pull them straight back out. He is going to be the backbone of both single strike archetypes that we believe will have any chance of seeing play uh, because this acceleration is just insane. Next up, we have Bronzong, uh, another very, very strong stage one Pokemon. Metal Trans, as often as you like. 
During your turn, you may move a metal energy from one of your Pokemon to another of your Pokemon. We've seen these sort of energy style, energy transferring abilities on all different types. Aromatis has been successful. Weavile hasn't been too successful. That's the one that's kind of broken the mold. Um, but even so, we still think this is going to be a very, very strong card. We alluded to how strong we think sort of Bronze on Corviknight as a defensive metal package is going to be. Uh, when we're talking about the Corviknight in the V and V Max video, um, we really stick by that. I think it's going to be a very strong defensive archetype that can also be uh, more aggressive and more consistent than Luke Metal. Uh, you're also able to, as we mentioned, have these highlight reel moments, these early tempo swings, because Bronzor has evolutionary advantage, uh, meaning that if you go second, you can evolve during your first turn, and all of a sudden, your sources are very, very live, especially if you've started with a Zacian, because it can mean a turn one Brave Blade, because you can essentially source it to the active, um, which is obviously absolutely bonkers. Paired with things like Cheryl and stuff like that, you're going to be able to uh, really reset a lot of the opponent's work uh, on some of these strong Pokemon like Corviknight. Uh, and obviously, with things like Aurora Energy, and if we ever see another Rainbow Energy style effect, uh, all of a sudden, we basically have a energy manipulate a Pokemon that can manipulate energy, uh, any type of energy, uh, because Aurora Energy plus something like a Rainbow Energy would be able to, you know, be used in a multitude of different situations. So there's a lot of potential for this card already. But even in a format where we only have Aurora Energy and we just have Metal Energy to play with, there's still such a great array of metal pokemon to be uh, sort of looking at it could be it it's almost certainly going to make uh, a bit of a splash and we do really think corbinite could be a very strong archetype uh the strong as some of these or archetypes have been in the past bronzong really has that similar feel to us yeah i'm so ready to build a, a spicy aurora based list as well we've seen already just on some like online tournaments that people have played like the ditto v with like a number of random v maxes for type coverage I could certainly see Bronzong Cheryl being a way to make that work as well. If you just play like Colossal Victini Dragapult, you have three great type coverages with like two energy efficient attackers. And if you just Metal Trans Cheryl those guys, it could be really spicy. So I'm going to try and build something like that as well. Next up, we go on to the colorless stuff. We have Indeedy. Definitely a fun one. Uh, it's a 90 hit point basic that has Collect to draw two. Which leads into Hand Kinesis, which does for two colourless ten times the number of cards in your hand. So, if anyone who enjoyed playing Unknown Hand knows that they can build an engine that goes quite aggressive with Roast Reveal and possibly even having Airmail in there as well, it means you could grow your hand size to around that sort of 20 mark. So the idea is that you're using just a Twin Energy or using Welder here for Hand Kinesis on a one prizer to get around 200 plus damage. You know, if your opponent isn't playing Marnies, like ideally they're a welder deck. <laughs> so they only have one or two stamps and you can be spanking them with Hand Kinesis. But most of the decks do play enough um, Hand Disruption in Marnie to make this difficult for you. Uh, the hope is that even if you are getting hit with Marnie, you have like enough Roast Reveals and you get into Crystal or you have um, Giant Half that you can still do like a hundred or so damage. Maybe even having like the Revenge Kangaskhan as a twin energy attacker in here could be something that you could think about. Uh, ultimately, going to be a ton of fun trying to grow that hand size, trying to glitch PTCGO because you get around that 30 card mark. You're going to want to see it on a video. I know you do. Uh, so we'll provide that at some point. Finally, we have Perugly, uh, which is basically in here because it has the Katadei attack, meaning that Katadei technically gets a buff. Uh, obviously, per Persian gives your Katadei Pokemon free attacks. And Claw Slash for 120 perfectly sets up Esper for being able to uh, do its, uh, I can't remember what the attack is called, but the sniping attack, essentially, uh, to KO VMAXs on the bench. So things like uh, Escape Rope and Fion, you can uh, sh shift the VMAX that you've just hit with Claw Slash to the bench, Esper for the KO. Again, it's something that we'll probably bring to you guys in a video, but we're not expecting it to make any waves in terms of meta shakeup. But it is worth noting that the Catherday deck does get a buff, and you will probably see it in a decklist video uh, on the channel at some point in not too long, I would imagine, knowing <laughs> us. <laughs> and that's it. That's our one prize ratings. Uh, these are typically the cards that we are most harsh on. It's a tough world out there for one prizes, being realistic. Whilst ADP is still around, it's a really tough ask for these decks. So we could only really be generous to the Rapid and Single Strike Synergy cards, as well as Bronzong, which kind of breaks that mold in that he will be put into probably some V and V Max decks as well. 
Whereas these other ones currently don't have much of a leg to stand on, unfortunately. Just the nature of the meta that we're in. A lot of these may be setting up for post-rotation though, so definitely worth looking into again at some point in the future. Definitely, and you can compare our scores with the community scores right there. Uh, typically so far we've been a little bit more generous than the community, but uh, as usually happens, we're a little bit harsher on the one prizes uh, because you guys are, you guys love your memes and we, uh, well, we don't meme hard enough. So unfortunately, we don't uh, quite have similar ratings when it comes to the one prizes. But uh, you can see it seems like even the community are pretty underwhelmed by some of these one prize archetypes. But the ones that are good, I think uh, it are very, very, have very, very exciting prospects. So that rounds up the final part of our set review. Thank you so much if you watched all three videos. If you're just stumbling upon the one prizes, do go back and check out the trainers and the V and V Max Pokemon. We've been talking for about three hours all today, but we're splitting it up as much as we can so that it's digestible for you guys so you can actually remember the highlights as well and just cherry pick if ever you need to refresh your memory. Um, do try and get your hands on some of these gold cards. Jack's one of his favorite Pokemon is Houndoom. I am yes. a big fan of Octillery just because of uh, Abyssal Hand as well. And the Cherim and Bronzong are the other uh, pre-release promos that you can get. So if you actually do want to get the build and battle kits, certainly some playable cards there for you as well, which I think is going to be epic. So yeah, that rounds out the set of you guys. Hope you'd enjoy all three segments. Let us know what you thought about the one prize reviews. Do you want to be playing some of these fun things? Have we mis-evaluated any of the cards along the way we'll hear it all in the discussion down below for now though that's it from us the set review is done we can now begin looking towards uh deck profiles for some of these things so on the channel upcoming it's going to be a mixture of brand new theory crafts for battle styles as well as sometimes some um shining fates deck lists on pcg uh, PTC Joe as well. So we will be darting between those for the next couple of weeks. I'm also going to try and get the impact of um, battle styles coming out hopefully in a week's time as well. So yeah, plenty to look forward to. Thanks so much, Jack, for sticking with me for the last three and a half hours or so. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll be back for the next one soon. Cheers.